other ordinary run-of-the-mill day of the year. <laughs> uh, I guess it's because when the uh, cats are away, the mice will play syndrome, which is always uh, rampant in the human soul. And uh, for those of you who are out playing, I would like to point out that the rats here in the studio are still having their ball. We're going along fine here. Oh, that's enough, Ralph. It's enough of that stuff. So it's Memorial Day. Uh, have you have you noticed that uh, that all other things come to a halt in America on vast holidays like the Fourth of July, like uh, Christmas, uh, Thanksgiving, Memorial Day? Everybody stops uh, whatever they're doing except radio. Radio has a compulsive quality about it. I, uh, I, I just, I just once would would uh, enjoy it if radio joined the rest of the human race, Ralph. And if we were to announce, say, about three o'clock on a Friday afternoon, W O R will not come on the air until eight a.m. Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> we're taking, we're, we're we're knocking off. You know, it's funny thing though about about Memorial Day. Uh, the the whole the whole. Uh, thing has a very special connotation to me. Now, Memorial Day uh, is very different, I notice, here in the East than it is out in other sections of the country. Uh, Memorial Day, I, I've noticed that anyway about holidays in general, that they're not celebrated the same from one end of the country to the other. Uh, take take a, a, a very uh, a non-holiday. Is, is Halloween a holiday or not? Now, seriously, would you consider this a holiday? It is it? No, I'm, I'm asking you a question. Is Valentine's Day a holiday? These are all sort of second-rate uh, folk celebrations, and yet they're 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 a national thing. They're 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 celebrated in a way across the country, and yet they're celebrated very differently. For example, uh, Halloween is a genuine major holiday in certain cities in the Midwest. For example, Cincinnati, Halloween is a fantastic operation. Uh, thousands of people parade through the streets on Halloween. They, uh, and it's not just a costume, it is like a celebration, a local holiday. Nothing happens on Halloween in New York except a few busted windows and a couple of guys get shot. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a, well, it's, let's face it, you know, it's not a big deal. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Memorial Day, for example, in, in the Midwest is celebrated, I notice, very differently from the way it is celebrated around here in the East. Sure, it's celebrated here. But in the Midwest, Memorial Day is a tremendous, uh, it's a, it's a big, uh, it's a big moment in time. I guess it's connected with a lot of things that happen out there. Memorial Day is generally considered to be, in the Midwest, the beginning of the traffic jam season. And, uh, <laughs> and, and everybody, uh, I remember my old man, for example, uh, usually Memorial Day came on the weekend. I don't know why, but it, it always does. It's, uh, it's usually around the weekend. And about two days before Memorial Day, the old man is out in the garage polishing the car for Memorial Day driving. No other reason than for that. He'd polish the doggone thing all the way up and down the back and around, and he'd take all the, all the chrome polish and work his knuckles down to the bone. And then, <laughs> then the morning of Memorial Day, we would go out in the car and get in the, the, the traffic jam. The traffic jam itself was the celebration of Memorial Day. And there would be a giant traffic jam that would develop at about 9 o'clock in the morning, extending all the way from roughly Elkhart, Indiana, to Milwaukee. Uh, now, the guys in Milwaukee would all be traveling south, and the guys in Elkhart, Indiana, would all be traveling north, and they would meet going in opposite directions. <laughs> There'd be a fantastic traffic jam. There would it would be the first radiator boil over of the season, and and it, when you'd get out on the porch around the, oh maybe noon, if you weren't traveling, you'd get out on the porch. You would smell the smell of millions of cars boiling over. You know that alcoholic smell, Ralph, that you get when a hupmobile is boiling over and the air is filled with rusty water. Well, that <laughs> that is the smell of Memorial Day. How long has it been since anybody has seen the little, you remember the three little flags they used to put on the front of cars on the radiator cap on Memorial Day with the little sticks, three little flags with the little golden uh, uh, spear point tip 
on the top of the flag, little flagpole, and the three little flags flying with a propeller on the front of it. You, had a, you could even get a propeller, you know, the kind of the red, white, and blue propeller on the whole scene on the front there, three little flags flying. Uh, <laughs> how long has this been? This used to be a major, uh, a major industry in America was selling flags for automobiles before the 4th of July and Memorial Day, those two big holidays, everybody uh, everybody flaunted flags. Uh, also, another thing, along with that same scene, was Memorial Day was generally the day, the first big day of the beach. Uh, nobody really sw did any swimming, but millions and millions of people would go to the beach in the Midwest on Memorial Day. Now, you know, I, I keep reading all kinds of... Uh, nostalgic pieces about Americana and I have a feeling that most of the nostalgia that is written about America really is usually relating to a day and time that nobody alive in America today with rare exceptions ever experienced uh, people will write about for example uh, 4th of July oratory Do you know that in my whole life I never heard a speech given on the 4th of July and yet I keep reading about that in, in various magazines, they talk about the Fourth of July orator. I suspect this had something to do with about the time of the Civil War. I don't think it had anything to do with most of our lives. Uh, they'll also talk about Memorial Day uh, celebrations, along with the with the uh, with the whole idea of the patriotic oratory. And all. I never saw any of that. I'll tell you what I remember about Memorial Day, which I think is probably more uh, more of a universal memory of Memorial Day. Is, is the peculiar sense of it was a grandmother day. A vague, non-kid day, uh, when you went visiting, you went, you went places like your, your aunt Min's house, uh, and everyone, uh, everyone has somehow, it was, it was a kind of lunch in the basket day, and everybody got out and walked around, and cars boiled over, and it was kind of vaguely hot, and people dressed up, but it did not have much to do with uh, oratory or celebration of the patriotic virtues, not at all, not 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 the Midwest at least. I'll tell you one thing that the Memorial Day seems to center on. Now, maybe in a sense, it's because we are a 20th century wild swinging, wheeled nation. Uh, this is a this is an automobile nation, boy, from the word go. There's no question about it. To me, Memorial Day was a celebration of the automobile. It was a celebration of something to do with the car. Now, it's not just my old man getting out and polishing the car. This is not, this is not the only thing that happens on Memorial Day. I think it's more than a coincidence that the biggest automobile race in the world, certainly in America, is run on Memorial Day. Why Memorial Day? Why couldn't it be run on, say, June 12th? Uh, why isn't it, yeah, seriously, it, it is run on Memorial Day. And, and in Indiana, now I'm going to, I'm going to do a show that I do every year. And, uh, this is, uh, this is my Memorial Day, uh, race show, which, uh, <laughs> I constantly get, get letters from people about because most people in the, in the New York area, uh, in the East don't know what a genuine folk right the running of the Memorial Day, the big 500, uh, mile race in Indianapolis is. Now, uh, this is something uh, that, that uh, you, I suppose in the way you have to experience it to really appreciate the full impact of it. It's like you have to experience a Macy Christmas to realize the true vulgarity of it. <laughs> I mean, you, have to, you, you can't describe it to people who have not experienced it. You have to experience a, an Easter... Uh, program at Radio City Music Hall to appreciate the true dynamic slobbery of it. You just have to appreciate that. You, you have to be there to see the girls all dancing, dressed up like Easter eggs, with, with big religious slogans on their chest that light up in neon signs and angels coming down out of the wings and all that. You have to, followed by a Doris Day picture, incidentally. <laughs> you have to, uh, you have to experience that to really truly understand the kind of uh, the kind of dynamic debauchery that it is. Now that's true of the Indianapolis Speedway race. A lot of people think it's just a race. It is not. Uh, the race is, an, as a matter of fact, is almost the uh, it's almost secondary to the true folk ritual that the that the running of this race represents. 
Uh, now, t- let's take let's take another example to show you uh, what I mean exactly. That they run a race at Ascot. Uh, I'm talking about in the the English Derby is run. Now, is the race the most important thing in this case, or is it the gathering of English nobility, the enclosure, uh, the gray beaver hats, uh, the Ascot ties, the whole scene, the old school, and all that? Uh, <laughs> nobody really worries about the race. The race is just a secondary thing. Who even knows who wins it? That isn't the point. The point is it's a kind of ritual. And so it is with the with the running of the Indianapolis Speedway race in Indianapolis, the big 500-mile classic. And about, well, I'll, I'll describe a typical Indiana household scene. About, uh, I would say, roughly 30 days before the race, my father would begin preparations. He would start polishing up thermos bottles. He would get out. He would get out his uh, his big. Uh, he, had, he had one of these big ice containers, you know, and these big ice box type things that you fill up with ice and beer cans. You see them in the beer commercials now, the big, big thing, sort of like a wash tub with, with big handles on it. The old man is down in the basement yelling and hollering because somebody's kicked it and it's got a dent in it and what happened over the winter, and he's cleaning this whole thing up, and it's about 30 days in advance of the race. My Uncle Charles would come over. Uncle Charles never showed up at our house except on race time. Whenever the big race was coming, he would come. Big slob Uncle Charles would show up, big fat guy. And and he's yelling and hollering. He's got the bottle openers. He's already prepared with all kinds of mats to sit on when you're going to play pinochle for the whole race going. He's pre- <laughs> He's got all that junk. My Uncle Fred would show up. He was the engineering uncle. And my Uncle Fred would always design gadgets for use at the big race, a gadget like a folding card table that he's made in the basement that has uh, straps on the side for beer cans, uh, <laughs> and, and it's got it's got a holster on the side for the binoculars, and it has extendable feet so that it extends 30 feet up in the air so that all of them can sit playing pinochle 35 feet above the track with big high seats and all that stuff. And Uncle Fred has been working all winter on this scene. Yeah, he's got little aluminum things. I remember them all trying it out in the backyard. Did, did I ever tell you about the time my Uncle Fred showed up with his rig? They call it they call it the raceway rig. And people vie with one another. Do you know about this? Vie with one another about designing equipment that can be used for watching the race. Now, you all know, you've seen these, these little seats that people use when they go to, uh, to uh, classy hunts. Uh, you know, that kind of the little, the little seat on the bottom. That is a very, very primitive version of what they do in Indiana for race day. In fact, uh, people have automobiles. They have cars that have been in the family for like 35 years that are used only for the purpose of going to the Indianapolis Speedway race. They'll have, say, for example, somebody will have bought somewhere along the line in an old used car lot, he'll buy a a 38 Chevy, and the whole interior of it is cleared out. It is painted dead white. Uh, The whole interior of it is cleared out, and on the back windows of it, they will have little dates of all the various races they have attended in this car, like 1943, or I guess there wasn't a race during the war, they'll have 46, they'll have 49, 50, 51, and little things, you know. And the name of the driver who won that race is written down underneath it. They'll have Wilbur Shaw, they'll have uh, all the various drivers all the way on up. And, and instead of having, you know how most cars have uh, uh, Grand uh, Canyon, uh, they'll have uh, Moving Desert of Maine, uh, <laughs> they'll have stuff like uh, Bar Harbor, you know, on the back of the car. Well, the Indianapolis car has little things, little cross flags and all that, of all the various races they've attended. Now, that's only part of it. The car itself will be fixed up inside with beds. The entire, all the seats are taken out, and the car has, uh, like inflatable cushions and stuff in the back there with curtains they can pull down. They can sleep in it. See, that's the whole point of it. And then on the side of it usually is built an aluminum box or a wooden box that contains the folded up rig. Now, the folded up rig really is a, is a, is an extendable folding, uh, folk grandstand. And so the way it works is that the, <laughs> that thing opens up and they put it together with bolts and it, it hooks onto the sides of the car, literally works onto the side of the car so that your little parking space becomes a, a whole establishment. And they build this thing up on top until finally above the car, maybe 20 feet above the car, is a tree house. The tree house 
has red, white, and blue bunting all around it. It has little furniture. It has it has uh, beach chairs, all kinds of jazz. All the, the people are really very proud of these things, and they will vie with one another for the most elaborate setup. It has ladders running up. There's a little telephone you can call down in the car, you know. You can wire it so you can hear your radio all the way up there. You know, the radio uh, has a little extension speaker up there. And they have fans, they have little air conditioning units and all that. And they all sit up there during the race and play Pinochle and Bridge. And by the way, this is another thing that is part of the Memorial Day celebration. Uh, these nuts, now that reminds me, this is WOR AM and FM, New York, Ralph. And uh, before we, speaking of, uh, of uh, little folk rituals, it's commercial time. Hit the button there, Ralph, if you will, please. Here's Stan Getz and Astrid Gilberto for McLean's. It's McLean's, the toothpaste that cleans with a new kind of taste that's right. What a taste, what a thing. Brand new smile, all the bells will ring. Got them wet, start tonight with McLean's. Taste the difference, try new McLean's, you go. You still using that sweet kid stuff? Try the new toothpaste that gets teeth irresistibly white. You can actually feel McLean's whitening. Your whole mouth feels refreshed and invigorated. Got them white. Start tonight with McLean's. Taste the difference. Try new McLean's. You go. Taste the difference. Try new McLean's. You go. <laughs> oh man, you know uh, you you want to hear more about this? Well, I'll tell you uh, the the people who go to this race, it is a genuine in club. Now, uh, out of the two hundred thousand or so, or two hundred fifty thousand, or however many go there, there's a fantastic amount of people go to this thing. There is a nucleus of people. I'd say probably around twenty or twenty five thousand people who literally constitute one of the most uh, exclusive clubs in America. These are the Indianapolis Speedway race nuts. Now, they don't go to any other race. Now, everybody thinks these are racing fans, that, uh, you know, they go to Indianapolis to see the big races, or they go down to uh, Milwaukee to see the races. No, no, these are not race fans. These are one specific thing. They are Indianapolis Speedway race fans. That's the only race they go to. Most cases all year. And every year they build their vacation around that week. Now, the Indianapolis Speedway week is, is more important than the actual running of the, of the race itself. As a matter of fact, the race running culminates the week. Uh, it culminates the end, it's like the end. It, 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 it marks the end of the celebration. And usually, uh, usually about Monday before the race. Let's say if the race is going to be run on a, on a Monday, like say this this uh, today, you know, if the race is going to be run on a Monday, usually about a week to two weeks before the nuts begin to gather in Indianapolis. Now they begin to line up. There's a road that runs parallel to the Indianapolis Speedway. They have a special setup there for them. Because this is such a big traditional thing. About two weeks before, the first Indianapolis cars start arriving. Now, I'm not talking about race cars. I'm talking about these 38 Chevys, these uh, pickup trucks, these uh, these uh, 1932 Mack trucks that have been built into this thing. And they start lining up one after the other along that road. And the people start socializing then with one another. They have known each other for 35 years, most of these people, and only see each other once a year. They don't, they're not friends outside of that. Uh, and so a guy from Goshen, Indiana will arrive and he immediately looks for his friend Clarence from, say, uh, Zanesville, Ohio, whom he only sees once a year. And sure enough, you'll see Clarence's car. Clarence is the big red 1932 Pontiac that's parked way down there. And immediately, they get together and they start their yearly beer party debauch. The two of them yelling and hollering, talking about what happened over the whole year. You know, do, do they talk about the race? No. It's a curious thing. It's it's a it's a it's a gathering of a certain kind of uh, a fraternity. It's hard to describe unless you've seen it. Now, what happens during the during the week before that? These cars are all lined up. Now, what are they waiting for? Well, they're waiting for dawn of race day. 
Dawn of Race Day opens up with the firing of a gigantic cannon. It's fired at the speedway. And up to that point, the, the, the gates are locked, you see. Uh, sure, there are people go in and out. And every day, people go in to watch the racers qualify. As you know, you've been reading, you know, you read about the qualifying runs. They run around, they, they qualify. Well, every day they go in, but nobody parks. In other words, you can't drive your car into the big infield, the big parking enclosure, which is where these race nuts watch the race from. Only the squares watch it from the grandstand. Uh, you've seen pictures, of, you know, of the race and you see the grandstand. This is for the tourists. This is for the yucks. The real race nuts watch it from the giant parking lot that's in the infield there. And each guy tries to get the same little space that he has occupied since Ralph De Palma won it in 1908 or whatever it was that he first went to this race. And he tries to get to this place. Now, how do you get to that same little slot every year? Well, you get there two weeks in advance. And you wait in line, and everybody's waiting in line there. And they all know each other's parking places, you see. But once in a while, an outlander will get in. He's going to try to get in, you know. So everybody's waiting. There's a big tenseness arrives. And the genuine competition at this race is not the actual running of the uh, Lotus Fords or the Offenhausers, but the running of the 32 Chevys versus the 38 Pontiacs to get to those choice parking spots at dawn on race day. And if if I ever, if I would ever like to make a a a movie, and I would wa and I would have the movie subject be hell, yes hell, I would go to Indianapolis at dawn, and take my 16 millimeter camera and set it up by the gate there, and wait for the booming of that cannon. Because the instant that cannon booms, no holes are barred. And remember, these are all old cars. You gotta remember that. These are, these are all 38 Pontiacs and 27 Whippets and all that stuff. These are all, you never saw such a collection of fantastic automobiles as you'll see at race day in Indianapolis on Memorial Day. So, boom, the cannon goes. And out of the dawn, you hear the, the thousands of ancient motors start, ah, they roar in through that gate. They pour in like a giant herd of rampaging cattle, banging of fenders, crashing of grills, thumping of trunks. You're boom, 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 and they're booming over that infield, and it's all holes. It's all rutted and pitted. You know, it's just like a like a just just a big chunk of grass in there, and they're booming. Boom, 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 boom. The dust flies. You can hear the screaming of the wounded. You can hear the thump of the bodies falling. <laughs> And then after about a half an hour of this fantastic river of metal and junk and paint and smoke and gasoline fumes and screams and yelling, you can hear the crashing of bumper against bumper and the roar of hubcap against hubcap. After about a half an hour of this fantastic uproar, it all settles down. And there they are. And they have won their race or they have lost it. And many a guy's whole year is shopped. If he arrives at his traditional parking place and there is a 27 Dodge pickup truck in there. He turns out there have been murders committed there. I'm telling you the truth. There have been murders committed there. There have been knife fights. <laughs> there have been guys kill their wives because their wives cost them five minutes when they should have been in the fight. And, and it all, it just a, a tremendous thing. They all break out. Then after about, oh, I'd say about an hour, it settles down. Now, what happened before that? This is a strange American folk right? Uh The weeks before the race, as they're all lining up, it starts about two weeks, and I'm not exaggerating, about two weeks before the race, the first idiot arrives, or this first celebrant, or whatever this kind of nutty celebration is, the first one arrives, and they begin to form behind him. Well, as the crowd grows day by day, the nightly celebrations grow. And so after about three days of this thing, there is a tremendous communal sort of trailer camp kind of life that develops. In fact, it's traditional. They all know each other. They've been having the same celebrations, the same card parties, the same beer drinking debauches, the same thing. That marriages have occurred between them, and they've grown up. Uh, some people have started coming there as kids, Ralph, at the age of five. They married... 
a girl from the next car, <laughs> they have, and now they're grandmothers, and they're still coming to this thing, and their kids are beginning to make the scene with other kids from the from the cars behind them. It's it's just like a, a, a genuine traditional thing that is part and parcel of these people's lives and is insoluble. You can't you can't melt it. It's 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 as important to their life as a druidic ceremony. And so about three or four days after the celebration starts, you see wandering Dixieland bands walking up and down the cars. And they're playing like mad. <laughs> guys are out there with their good humor carts. Guys are selling pizzas to them from the little wagons. And you see guys wandering up. They set up portable restaurants. And the city of Indianapolis, realizing, of course, this fantastic thing has grown over the years, um, has made preparations for it. So all along the route, they have set up portable sanitation facilities. There's all kinds of portable johns, you know. They have little places where you can go and fix your, you know, you get your hair cut and everything. And the, and literally what, it, what happens there is there's a kind of camp-like gypsy nomadic existence is set up for a full two weeks. Now, how do these guys do this? Well, most of them set their entire year around this period in time. They will take their vacation. And some of them travel from as far away as places like, oh, California. There's guys that, tra oh, this is not just Indiana. There are guys that travel from Alaska. There are guys that travel from Mexico. And they're all, they're all part of this little club. Now, what happens when the race starts? Well, that's, that's a fascinating thing to watch. Uh, so here, here, here they are all now. They're down on the parking lot, and within ten minutes, their little houses are all set up, and they've set up housekeeping. Well, you'd wonder why they want to set up housekeeping. Well, the race is only three hours long, you know. It's maybe even less than that. So it's about three hours long. After all, they go five hundred miles. Uh, they average something like a hundred and forty miles an hour average on this thing. So you can figure it can't be much more than three hours, and yet they come prepared to live for two years. They have the little awnings they pull down, and they have ladders, and they have they have easy chairs, and they have bunks, and the whole scene. Now, why is this? Well, it's because in the early days of the race, when this tradition started, the cars were much slower. And so the automobiles that ran at the Indianapolis race maybe would average 80 miles an hour or 90 miles an hour in the very early days of this thing. And a race would take, a 500-mile race was like an all-day race. And it would start and go on and on and on and on until almost dusk when the, when the last bit of wreckage was swept up and the last body is carried off. Then by that time, they would be willing to quit. Well, now, of course, in the days of the, of the three hour race, uh, they still have the same traditional equipment for the earlier races. Now, about, I'd say about a month before Memorial Day, my, my, my father and his cronies would begin to gather. Old Heine Gertz would show up. <laughs> My Uncle Charles would show up. Now, these guys had very little. They didn't have much uh, involvement with each other during the year. And, it, and it, had, it had almost the same feeling about it as a yearly fishing trip. Now, you know, you know what that is like. Most people know about the kind of thing where, where the guys gather together once a year to go up to uh, Canada to hunt moose or uh, to go to Pennsylvania to hunt a deer, or to go up to Maine to fish for salmon. They all get together at one time, and they go. Well, that was the kind of thing that this race is. Now, how, how about the race itself? This is, this is madness. This is, a, this is a kind of madness that can only happen with a certain kind of person. Now, it is, it is very glib for people. I constantly read uh, these glib reports and things like Sports Illustrated and all that about the Indianapolis Speedway race, and they always bring in the idea that these people really uh, are a kind of sadist. They're kind of a sad. They, they want to see people killed. They go there to see a guy get killed, or they go there to see a wreck. Well, I, I submit to you that they don't really go there for the race at all, that the race itself is often not even really looked at by the people who are part of this very special clique that forms the backbone of the Indianapolis Speedway race. They will look at the first, the opening moments, when the first cars, you know, they line up in those, in those, uh, 11 rows of three each, ranging all the way from the pole position all the way down to the last car. And incidentally, these people are, are fantastically knowledgeable about all the drivers, about all the cars that have ever raced there at Indianapolis. But that does not mean that they're race fans. It's part of the tradition. You see, it's part of the, of the of the whole concept of the Indianapolis Speedway race. You have to know that. 
And so these old duffers will sit around and they'll talk about great races of the past. One will be talking about Pete DiPaolo. Somebody will be talking about, about Pony Bettenhausen. These are great names of the past. Uh, somebody will say, oh yeah, but Fred Frame. Now there was nobody ever like Fred Frame and they'll discuss Fred Frame. The year Fred Frame won it in a, in a, in an Alfa Romeo 2-9 and they'll go on and on and on about this. And all the while, out there on the track, the cars are going, they're not looking. They're sitting there talking about the race in 28. Or they're sitting there arguing about what happened in 36 when Billy so-and-so lost the wheel and went into the, went into the infield. The cars, then they'll once in a while they'll hear a strange noise. See, they're attuned to noises out there. They're attuned to the sound. And so, if the cars are running normally, you know, you, they don't even look. But once in a while, they'll hear, somebody is having trouble. Immediately, they look out, you know, and they'll see number 13 or number 74 is going down. They say, uh-oh, 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 he's having trouble with his oil. He's getting an oil leakage, and he's just about to blow a cylinder or something. They watch and watch, and then they go back to their card game. Uh, they'll they'll sit there and wait, and sure enough, a couple of minutes later, you hear the uh, you'll hear the announcement. will say, uh, "Car number twenty-seven in the back stretch, driven by Charlie Brown, is now out of the race due to an oil leakage, rendering his car inoperative." They say, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. well, I can hear that. That was uh, you could hear that coming. A couple of laps there, boy. Uh, let's see, uh, your deal, isn't it, Fred? Okay, let's go. <laughs> and they're drinking the beer, and all the while, wow, wow, the cars are going round and round and round and round, and it's a, it's, it's as purely a folk ritual as anything that the Druids ever dreamed of. The sound, the smell, oh, there's nothing like the smell of being at the Indianapolis Speedway. It's a combination of those bricks. It's, it doesn't smell like any other race I've ever been to. I've been to the races in Langhorne. I've been to the races all around the country. But there is a special smell to that Indianapolis 500 mile. To begin with, the cars are different than most cars that you see running in, in uh, the average race. Uh, these are the big cars. These are the Indies. And you get that smell. There's a very special kind of smell to them. It isn't castor oil. It's something else. It's a combination of the, the covering of those bricks they've got out there. It's a, it's the Indiana countryside, which stretches for millions of miles all around. This is in the flattest part of Indiana, by the way. For those of you who've never been around there, this is like a, a town set right in the middle of a giant billiard table. And it is so flat that you can go to the edge of Indianapolis and you can stand on your tippy toes and you can see way down there, you can see Ohio, <laughs> like 200 miles away, you know. And if you stand on your tippy toes and look the other way, you can see the lights of Chicago, 250 miles to the north. And this town lays right on the flattest part of the country you, should, you can really imagine. And there, there, are, there are cottonwood trees. Uh, the town is loaded with cottonwoods. This is cottonwood country. And so you smell that kind of plain smell, which is a smell of of uh of hot sun baking on sandy soil for uh, 18,000 years, millions of years. Sandy, loamy soil. You smell a vague smell of the barnyard. There are farms all around that area. And once in a while, the 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 the, uh, the wind will blow in a whiff of, of 50 million pig styes, which are not. Oh no, it doesn't smell. But it just smells. You know that 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 bucolic smell of Indiana is there. It's right there. And you mingle that with this high, this high octane fuel, the alcohol they burn, they burn all kinds of special fuels, and the smell of the rubber. Now this is probably the, the subtlest of all the smell, because you know, they burn up tires like, uh, like mad on this, this track, this brick track. And they're making that, that constantly, that same turn, you know, this is a, this is, these racers are designed to go only one direction, you know. The wheels are all a certain size, so they constantly make that counterclockwise turn. They just, they're, they're not built to make a clockwise turn. They only make that straight counterclockwise. The wheels are all built so the car runs on a tilt. If you were to drive one of these cars on a straight highway down the street, it would look like it's at an angle. It's all tilted, strange. But it's built for this big bowl. And those cars running on that, that brick track send up a smell of burning rubber. 
mingled with the smell of pigs, the smell of old corn shocks from last year, the smell of people walking around in flowered print dresses, fat ladies, the smell of, 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 <laughs> of Eskimo buy, pies, the smell of knee-high orange spilled on hoods of, of 1938 Oldsmobiles. All this mingled together makes this Indianapolis Speedway a peculiar kind of American thing. Now, I know that, that, uh, that 250 years from now, have you ever had the feeling, uh, when you look at, at the pictures of ruins, I've had this feeling, maybe it's just the kind of mind I have, I don't know, but I, I remember going through Pompeii and seeing all these houses and all the little shops and the streets and the signs and all that, and I, and I, and I couldn't help but think, you know, there was a time when these people were walking around here and they could not conceive of tourists, uh, Try to figure out what happened here. Uh, try to try to uh, imagine the life of Pompeii. Well, every time I go to something like Indianapolis, now this is a big oval brick speedway. Now you know bricks last a long time. You know you know this. See, just like those little bricks in Pompeii, they're there for thousands of years. They're just bricks. They didn't have anything special. They made them like we make bricks. Well, those bricks at that Indianapolis Speedway are going to last for thousands of years. And one day, it's just, it's got to come gradually, one day, all of this will be over. All of the racing at Indianapolis will be done. And all of, this, all of the smells and the rubber and the gasoline will have disappeared. And down deep under that sandy, loamy soil with the waving grass over it and the sun beating down will be that ancient Speedway just laying there and there will be there will be the outlines of where the the uh the well the grandstands were there will be the outlines of where the pits were and and thousands of years from now maybe 10,000 years somebody will be digging and they'll put this thing together you know they'll dig it up and they'll clear up all the sun they wonder what happened what went on here what kind of things were going on here and they they will write monographs on it books but I know the one thing that they won't have. They will not know. They will not know the smell of the speedway or the sound of the speedway. Can you imagine, have you ever thought how it must have smelled in the Roman Colosseum in its heyday? Can you imagine sitting there in your toga <laughs> and it's a hot day. Oh, it gets hot in Rome, you know. It's a hot day and the Colosseum is new. And you know, to the people of Rome, the Colosseum looked like it, obviously, have you ever seen it? It looks like, like it's forever, you know, you can't imagine. I'm sure that anybody sitting in the middle of a big day when they have a real exciting card of Christians and lions there, you know, and you've been looking forward to it for weeks, and you're sitting among 85,000 other Romans, you can never imagine as this being all over one day. They couldn't imagine this. But can you imagine how it must have smelled? It's a hot Roman day, you know, you can smell, you can, no, no, don't go, ugh, no, it would smell very good in, in a very odd way because, you know, out there the Roman countryside is very lush around there. You can smell the river, the Tiber is not too far from there. You can smell the trees, those big green trees, and you can smell, you know, you can, obviously you would have to be able to smell the lions down there, you know, like in a zoo, you smell all the lions, you can smell, and they serve food there, you know, guys, so they had vendors there, and they're up and down, yeah, they did, that's a fact. They were up and down there selling selling food and all that. But we just can't imagine how it must have smelled and how it must have sounded. And so about an hour and a half before the big card opened, you can see this guy sitting there, you know, this Roman sitting there, way down deep in the bowels of the Colosseum. You can hear... <laughs> A lion is roaring. <laughs> And, and he hears the crowd, and he can smell the olive oil, and he can smell the pizza smoking away somewhere there. Ralph, can you give me a little stars and stripes here, if you will? Oh, yeah. And someday, a million years or more from now, they are going to be wondering what happened out there in the vast plains of middle America. Out there where the sky stretches on and on and on, and the sun sits like some red-hot poker over that vast speedway, those bricks. Out there where the grandstand stands stark against the blue-golden sky of mid-spring. 
and you can smell the that 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 wafting aroma of a million burning tires and baking paint on ancient automobiles and old transmissions about to decay into the dust from whence they sprang. The smell of a thousand, nay, a million empty beer cans all mingled together to celebrate the memorial of America's great patriotic day. Ah, yes, but we know, don't we? Or do we? Do we know about these great things? And so, uh, every year I do my Memorial Day race show. And uh, I hope someday, 9,000 years from now, when they're trying to put together what happened out there in that vast plain, in that strangely shaped elliptical brick pathway, if somebody will dig up one of these tapes and play it and try to figure out what did happen. None of us know. Oh, the sound of one of those Oppenhausers coming out of that big north bend, laying it down to the straight, is a sound like you'll never hear again. And then you can hear the sound of one of the Ford Lotuses coming. They have a different sound. And then another offing. They have a rough, high, screaming snarl. And then another load of... Smoother, cleaner, but always vicious. Underneath it all.